So this morning marks our third message in our Christmas series for this year, God with us. Um, And we're looking at five progressive prophecies of Messiah or Emmanuel, which means God with us. Our, Our focus as we approach Christmas Day is the reality and the importance of the incarnation, the the arrival of God himself in the flesh as the human person, Jesus. And, And we've looked at the announcement of Messiah, God with us from Isaiah 7, the expected arrival of Messiah with us, God, from the ninth chapter of Isaiah. And this morning we're gonna consider the expected role of Messiah from Isaiah 11. In honor of God's word, then let's stand and read our focal passage together, which today is Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 through 12. And the Bible says, Then a shoot will grow up from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him, a spirit of wisdom and understanding, a spirit of counsel and strength, a spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. His delight will be in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes. He will not execute justice by what he hears with his ears. But he will judge the poor righteously and execute justice for the oppressed of the land. He will strike the land with a scepter from his mouth. And he will kill the wicked with a command from his lips. Righteousness will be a belt around his hips. Faithfulness will be a belt around his waist. The wolf will dwell with the lamb and the leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf, the young lion, and the fattened calf will be together and a child will lead them. The cow will, and the bear will graze. Their young ones will lie down together and the lion will eat straw like cattle. An infant will play beside the cobra's pit and a toddler will put his hand into the snake's den. They will not harm or destroy each other on my entire holy mountain. For the land will be as full of the knowledge of the Lord as the sea is filled with water. On that day, the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the peoples. The nations will look to him for guidance, and his resting place will be glorious. On that day, the Lord will extend his hand a second time to recover the remnant of his people who survive from Assyria, Egypt, Pathros, Cush, Elam, Shinar, Hamath, and the coasts and islands of the west. He will lift up a banner for the nations and gather the dispersed of Israel. He will collect the scattered of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Amen. Uh, Before we pray, I wanted to mention that right now we have several church members who are battling COVID. Um, So please keep our church family in your prayers. Um, None of them are here, uh, but um, keep them in your prayers um, and, uh, and lift them up. And, and if you know anyone who is, in, encourage them um, and, uh, and be a blessing to them. Let's pray. God, we thank you that we have this time set aside to gather together and look at your word and reflect upon your truth. And Lord, thank you for giving us a season like Christmas where we can sort of set aside the the distractions to a certain extent and come focusing on the greatest gift ever given for Christmas, the gift of your Son, our Lord and Savior. And God, we pray that right now you would be our focus, that as we look at your word, as we consider the truth of the birth of your Son, And the role that he has as Prince of Peace, we pray that, Father, you would speak to us by your Spirit. And that you would be glorified in this place and in our lives and our hearts. That, Father, you would touch lives from your word today. God, we pray for those who are suffering through the impact of the storms that have happened this weekend, people in the middle of our country, Arkansas and Illinois and Missouri and Mississippi and Tennessee and especially in Kentucky, God. We pray especially for Mayfield, Kentucky and the devastation that they have seen this weekend. 
Lord, we pray that you would bless them. God, that you would allow those with resource and availability to minister to them. And God, that somehow you would bring your glory out of that devastation. And Father, as we have opportunity, make it clear to us how to serve. Now, Lord, I pray that you would cover over my weaknesses and failings as a man and allow me, God, to preach your word clearly and with boldness for your glory and our blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 You may be seated. Thank you. Okay, so the English language is a funny thing. We often take words and we use them in lots of different ways. Um, Last week, for example, I said that Messiah's arrival would be a light. Now think about that word for just a moment, light. On vocabulary.com, the word light has 46 definitions. Did you know that you can light a light light to make the light more light? You can. That's an extreme example, I know, but you can. Everyone's like, wait a minute, I'm lost. Yes, you can, you can light a light light to make the light more light. Well, now, while it doesn't have 46 definitions, the word reconcile is a word that can take on different meanings as well, depending on what you're referring to. Um, You you can reconcile your bank balance, you can reconcile yourself to a difficult task, or you can reconcile or be reconciled to an unexpected outcome. But this morning, we're going to consider the term reconcile or reconciliation in the sense of bringing peace and harmony to those who are opposed to each other. This is the kind of reconciliation that Messiah would come to bring. Now, we've, we've all been in situations in our lives where we needed to be reconciled to someone else. Uh, a personal story and one that's actually still pretty emotionally touchy for me. Um, a little over a year ago, I got crossways with someone whom I love very much, not, not my wife or kids. Um, things were said in the heat of a disagreement that created a rift between us, and, and um, they said something that I took in the worst possible way, and I brought correction and judgment on them pretty aggressively, um, probably too aggressively, and, um, and without listening to them. I wasn't fair in my approach. And even though afterwards I apologized for the assumptions that I made that led to me saying the things that I said in the way that I said them, the conflict wasn't resolved quickly. Um, I was basically counseled to just sort of wait. They'll, they'll be okay. They'll, you know, it'll pass. But months went by and it didn't pass. Um, And especially in my more quiet moments, I mean, the worst was like ironing on Sunday mornings. That was the worst. Especially in my more quiet moments, the conflict would come back to my mind and my heart and hurt all over again. I mean, when you're ironing, you're not really thinking. You're just sort of, right? And that's when my, my mind would especially just drift to that place and think about the conflict. I literally thought about this conflict every day for seven months, seven months. And when I finally couldn't wait any longer, I reached out one more time, praying for reconciliation. I mean, have you been there? Anyone else been there in that kind of level of conflict where it just is eating you up? You, you know there's strife and conflict. You desperately want to see reconciliation come. You want to be back in this place of peace and harmony with the person that you've offended or who's offended you for the conflict to end and for there to be forgiveness and restoration of the relationship. Well, my, my olive branch, just to finish the story, I guess, was accepted and the person I was at odds with and they, they opened the door to communication again. We were able to reconcile completely, restoring our relationship to one of peace and, and harmony again. What a relief that is, right? I mean, some of you, after I said the story, you were like holding your breath. What happened? Right? Because we all know what that feels like. It, it consumes us in a way. 
There's something so wonderful about being brought back to a place of peace with someone that you've been in conflict with. And the Bible tells us that we're in conflict with our God, and so we need to be reconciled with him somehow. But because it's God who's the chief party impacted by our sinfulness, he's the one who has to initiate the process of reconciliation. Fortunately, he did so because the Messiah is the Prince of Peace. We just sang about him. And and, and last week, we looked at that scripture in Isaiah chapter 9. In our focal passage this morning, we will see that it's the Messiah. He is the one who is going to bring peace and harmony. He he brings reconciliation. Messiah takes our broken, fractured relationship with God and he brings us back to him. As I mentioned in my introduction, we've looked at God with us and with us, God. Well, today we're going to look at us with God. The fact that through the work and ministry of the Messiah, we are brought back into that right relationship with the Lord. We're reconciled to him. The Messiah, our our prince of peace, he is the administrator of a right relationship between the holy God, our king, and his sinful subjects, man. He's the royal provider of peace. Now remember that in the context of the message in Isaiah to this point, there wasn't much hope for the southern kingdom of Judah due to the the sinfulness of their king Ahaz. Um, He had reached out for help from the Assyrians, even though he had been told by God that, that God would take care of the problem that was at hand. And basically, now Isaiah opens up this next prophecy in in our focal passage today about the Messiah by saying to Ahaz that like a great tree that has been chopped down, the royal line of David has become a stump. Look at verse 1. Then a shoot will grow from the stump of Jesse and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. The stump of Jesse is the line of King David because Jesse was David's father and that lineage was represented by Ahaz at that moment. Now obviously, a stump is what a tree used to be. Isaiah is actually here playing off of the prophecy that he's just finished giving about Assyria's future downfall at the end of chapter 10, and he connects it beautifully so that there's no question about what was going to become of Ahaz, of Ahaz's line. This is the two verses right before this, Isaiah 10, 33 and 34. Look, the Lord God of armies will chop off the branches with terrifying power, and the tall trees will be cut down, the high trees felled. He is clearing the thickets of the forest with an axe, and Lebanon with its majesty will fall. Assyria will fall. It will become like felled trees. A message of hope, right? But immediately then, in verse 1 of chapter 11, it's revealed that the line of Jesse would be a stump as well. But there's still hope. This barren, seemingly lifeless stump will produce a shoot that will grow into a branch that will bear fruit. Life will return to the line that appeared to be dead. The stump of David's royal family will spring back to life in the person of Messiah. And he'll be unlike any king who had come before him because he will be filled with the Spirit of the Lord, according to verse 2. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him, a spirit of wisdom and understanding, a spirit of counsel and strength, a spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. This branch from the stump of Jesse would be full of everything that he needs to govern his people perfectly in contrast to the foolish Ahaz. The Messiah King would be covered by God's Holy Spirit and have wisdom, understanding, counsel, strength, knowledge, and most importantly, the fear, not terror, but respect of the Lord that Ahaz obviously lacked. And because of this, Messiah will be able to to bring reconciliation between God and man to make it possible for mankind, again, to walk in harmony and peace with our Lord. And we can see three spheres in which he does this in our passage this morning. The first one is peace for his people. 
The first place that Messiah will bring peace is for his people, a great message of both hope and fear for the people of Judah who had gone astray from God's commands for some time due to Ahaz's apostasy and who now lived in a constant state of dread over when Assyria would arrive to wipe them out as they were about to do to the northern kingdom of Israel. Messiah's priorities, unlike Ahaz's, would be right and he would lead his people well. Look at verses 3 through 5. His delight will be in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes. He will not execute justice by what he hears with his ears, but he will judge the poor righteously and execute justice for the oppressed of the land. He will strike the land with a scepter from his mouth and he will kill the wicked with a command from his lips. Righteousness will be a belt around his hips. Faithfulness will be a belt around his waist. So first of all, the reason that I say that this part of the chapter is about bringing peace to his people is that it speaks of the land twice. And we have already seen that he would be a branch from the stump of Jesse. And so we have this contrast between Judah's current King Ahaz and the Messiah. Also, we'll see later that Isaiah specifically talks about the nations coming to him as well. So the focus here in this part is on God's chosen people. Note that verse 3 says that the Messiah's delight will be the fear of the Lord. Not only will he have appropriate respect and reverence for the Lord, but he will also delight in the fear of the Lord in others, as others fear him. And because of this delight in the fear of the Lord, he's going to judge rightly and fairly, not simply based on appearances or on hearsay, but because he will know the actual truth of those he judges, and his moral compass will be perfect. He'll give justice to the poor and to the oppressed, and he'll exact punishment on the wicked through his just and fair rulings. Remember last week in Isaiah 9-7, we saw that his kingdom would be established and sustained with righteousness and justice from now on and forever. Righteousness and faithfulness will be so evident in his life that it is as if he wears them as clothing. You can see it, a belt or a sash. Now this passage has has much in common with the Magnificat, or or prayer of praise from Mary, following the spirit-prompted testimony of her cousin Elizabeth when Mary arrived at her house months before the first Christmas day. Listen to Luke chapter 1. And Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior because he has looked with favor on the humble condition of his servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed because the mighty one has done great things for me and his name is holy. His mercy is from generation to generation on those who fear him. He has done a mighty deed with his arm. He has scattered the proud because of the thoughts of their hearts. He has toppled the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. He has satisfied the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering his mercy to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he spoke to our ancestors. It's a beautiful connection. God's promise of bringing forth Messiah for his people has always been a message of peace through victory. From the declaration of the fall that the child of the woman would crush the serpent's head, a very grave injury, even as the serpent struck the offspring's heel, a minor injury in comparison, through the narratives of Noah and Abraham, of Moses and Joshua, and on through David and Solomon, whenever we see a picture of Christ reflected in a person, it's an image of peace through victory. This message of peace was even given on that first Christmas morning through the heavenly host. Luke 2, 13 and 14. Suddenly there was a multitude of the heavenly host with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to people he favors. So the first place that we find this message of reconciliation, of peace through Emmanuel in this passage, is for those who belong to God, his people. Messiah's kingdom is one of justice and righteousness always and blessing and judgment applied fairly and in truth. And because he is Lord over all things and fully in control, his rule should bring peace to those who belong to him. 
even in the midst of the most trying of circumstances like they were facing in Judah. But Jesus said this in John 14, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Don't let your heart be troubled or fearful. We live in a time today where this message of Messiah bringing peace that's not like the world's should cause us to say hallelujah. We just said hallelujah over and over and over, didn't we? Sometimes it seems that the world's idea of peace is that everybody better toe some constantly moving and shifting line about what is right and just, but that's not peace. It's arbitrary. It's just behavior modification based on fear of reprisal. You can't threaten someone into true reconciliation. Jesus says that his kind of peace isn't the world's kind of peace. It's not temporary or tenuous. His peace isn't based on lies or bribes or threats or the latest hot topic. It's based on what's true and right and just at all times. And most importantly, it's based on our being reconciled to a right relationship with God himself. As Paul wrote in uh, Romans chapter 5, he said, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. While Messiah's kingdom is a kingdom to look forward to when Jesus returns and sets all of creation back the way it should be, those of us who belong to him get to taste that peace now because of what God has done through Messiah. He's reconciled us to himself through the death of Christ on the cross, and in doing so, Messiah brings peace between enemies, which is our second point. I don't mind admitting that my study for my sermon this week, um, while I was studying it, this section of verses was a bit of a stumper for me for quite a while. Even though it was, this, it was this next little piece of this passage that inspired the direction of reconciliation for this message. Um, it, the, the picture of reconciliation is easy enough to see in the next three and a half verses, but the meaning of those pictures was what took me a while to kind of understand. So Isaiah 11, verses 6 through the first half of 9, bless you. The wolf will dwell with the lamb and the leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf, the young lion, and the fattened calf will be together and a child will lead them. The cow and the bear will graze, their young ones will lie down together and the lion will eat straw like cattle. An infant will play beside the cobra's pit and a toddler will put his hand into a snake's den. They will not harm or destroy each other on my entire holy mountain. Okay, so Bill, what's the problem? Why is this so hard to get? It seems pretty straightforward right? It's a pretty simple picture of reconciliation. The wolf and the lamb lying down together in harmony. The, the leopard taking a nap with a goat, which would be a cool thing to see, I think. Um, predator and prey, now dear friends in Messiah's kingdom. I agree, it's pretty straightforward. And, and I think that a straightforward explanation is best. This is what it's going to look like on earth when Jesus returns to set up his earthly kingdom. It'll just be peace everywhere. His peace is going to extend even to the animal kingdom and the natural enmity between wild animals and mankind. However, I believe that there is something more immediate for us to understand and apply from this section. Each of the pairings in this part of our focal passage today, shows animals who are enemies of each other in their natural state. Wolves eat lambs. I'm sure that a leopard would enjoy having a nice fat goat for dinner, and not in a social sense. I would guess that bears and lions would eat cows if given the opportunity. But in the kingdom of Messiah, the Prince of Peace, these enemies have been reconciled to each other. They will not harm or destroy each other. As I worked through this passage this week, I was reminded that in our natural state, we are someone's enemy as well. And Messiah's ministry reconciles even that enmity. And who is this enemy when we are in our natural state? God himself. Not that we have the same kind of predator-prey relationship as this picture, but that in our natural state, in his supernatural holy state, we're set in conflict against our God. 
The Bible tells us that because of our sin, that is the ways that we go against God's holy and righteous character, we're separated from him. We deserve punishment for this sin in the form of death, permanent and eternal separation from God. It isn't that we just mess up. It's not that we just make mistakes. It's not that we stumble. It's that we actively rebel against our loving God, who is king. So we can't save ourselves. We're too far gone for that. We need someone to provide for our reconciliation, to pay the penalty for our sin, and enter then Messiah, Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, the Son of God, who came as a sinless baby, grew into a sinless man, and then died an unjust death to take the punishment that we deserve so that we can be reconciled to God. This reconciliation comes through faith, trusting in what Christ has done to save us, turning away from our own methods and ideas of salvation, surrendering to him as both our Savior and our Lord. The Apostle Paul wrote about this reconciliation in Romans, just a little bit further into chapter 5, starting in verse 6. For while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For rarely will someone die for a just person, though for a good person, perhaps someone might even dare to die. But God proves his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. How much more then, since we have now been justified by his blood, will we be saved through him from wrath? For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, then how much more, having been reconciled, will we be saved by his life? And not only that, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received this reconciliation. Remember, in our natural state, we're God's enemies because of our sins. And God's love is proven by the fact that Jesus died for God's enemies, us. It's not that we are the righteous person at the beginning of that passage. It's not that we're even the good person that someone might perhaps dare to die. None of us are. We're all fallen. We're all broken. And the depth of the reconciliation is a picture of the depth of the salvation as well. If we trust in Christ's death by faith, And we also receive his eternal life because he defeated death in our place as well. This is why Messiah came. One more passage on this idea from the book of Colossians. Colossians 1, 19 through 22. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile everything to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated and hostile in your minds as expressed in your evil actions, but now he has reconciled you by his physical body through his death to present you holy, faultless, and blameless before him. God's intent in sending Jesus was to provide the means for all of creation to be restored and reconciled to him, but especially mankind. He will eventually set everything in creation right, as I said before, but for now, Jesus has paid the death that we deserve so that we can be holy and faultless and blameless before God. So we can be his friends through faith instead of his enemies. And this offers for everyone. There's there's no one who is so far gone that Jesus can't save them. Not me, not you, not the person who lives down the road. Trust in Christ's sacrifice and be reconciled to the Lord today right now even. Those who have been reconciled to God through faith in Christ are the Lord's people, the Lord's children. And because of Messiah, those children will come to be at peace from all the nations, which is our third point, peace for the nations. The empire of Assyria, who overthrew the northern kingdom of Israel, and the empire of Babylon, who later would overthrow the southern kingdom of Judah, Both had a means of breaking the spirit and national identity of the people they conquered. They would deport them. They would come in, take over, and carry off most, sometimes all, of the people so that they would no longer have a connection to the land where they lived. They'd be relocated to some other part of the empire and forced to start over. But God has already promised to Ahaz through Isaiah's son's name 
that a remnant will return. Remember from two weeks ago, Isaiah's son, Shear Yashub, went with Isaiah to see King Ahaz when he gave that first Emmanuel prophecy. His name means a remnant will return, literally. Isaiah bringing his son with him was a testimony of what God was going to do later, even though they hadn't even gone into captivity yet. Years before the northern kingdom fell, more than a century before the southern kingdom fell, God promised that he would bring them back, and here he tells of Messiah's role in making that return possible. The second half of verse 9, For the land will be as full of the knowledge of the Lord as the sea is filled with water. On that day, the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the peoples. The nations will look to him for guidance, and his resting place will be glorious. On that day, the Lord will extend his hand a second time to recover the remnant of his people who survive from Assyria, Egypt, Pathros, Cush, Elam, Shinar, Hamath, and the coasts and islands of the west. He will lift up a banner for the nations and gather the dispersed of Israel. He will collect the scattered of Judah from the four corners of the earth. So Isaiah here promises that the land will be at peace because the land will be full of the knowledge of the Lord. Because on that day, the root of Jesse, interesting change from shoot and branch, which draw their strength from the stump, to root, which provides strength to the stump. He is both before and after. Well, he's going to stand as a banner for all people. Back in the days when we used to take our student ministry to Centrifuge Camp at Glorietta, there would be hundreds of students there from all over covering grades 6 through 12. And they'd all be mixed into different Bible study groups. It wasn't like you had your church Bible study group. And all the ages would be interspersed with each other. Well, when they would meet on the, on the rec field in teams for recreation time, and the way they got everyone together was through banners. Big flags on high poles that would be lifted high above the heads of everyone there. It was so students coming to the rec field could see where their group would gather. They'd know where to go. They'd know what to do. A banner is a rally point. A place to look for direction, for guidance, and sometimes for hope. In Exodus 17, when Israel was in battle against the Amalekites, Moses stood on the mountain above the fray and held the staff of God high above his head. Eventually, Aaron and Hur came to help him hold his arms up because they were getting tired. And when Israel won the battle with the help of the Lord that day, Moses built an altar at the spot. And he called the place Yahweh Nisi, which means the Lord is my banner. So Messiah himself will be a banner for the nations to see and rally to. And this rally point will especially have meaning for God's people because Christ will be the point that even the Hebrew people return to from being scattered throughout the world. And this banner, Messiah, will be the place that the faithful among the nations, both Gentile and Jew, will come to be reconciled to one another, living in peace throughout the world. And that reconciliation has already started. Because through the death of Christ, the hostility between the Jew and the Gentile has been put to death as well. Here is how Paul explained this reconciliation of the nations in Ephesians chapter 2. So then remember that at one time you were Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcised by those called the circumcised, which is done in the flesh by human hands. At that time, you were without Christ excluded from the citizenship of Israel and foreigners to the covenants of promise without hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who are far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who made both groups one and tore down the dividing wall of hostility. In his flesh he made of no effect the law consisting of commands and expressed in regulations, so that he might create in himself one new man from the two, resulting in peace. He did this so that he might reconcile both to God in one body through the cross by which he put the hostility to death. He came and proclaimed the good news of peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. Amen. Amen. In Christ, disparate people can be one. In Christ, the nations can find peace. In Christ, everyone who belongs to him has access to the Father and has been given right standing with him. 
Only Christ can bring this kind of peace. Only Christ can bring total reconciliation. And he will one day. But we get to live it out now. Which brings me to a close on one additional point that I want to make in, in, in way of challenge to the church. Jesus, the Messiah, has come and has started this ministry of reconciliation. However, he's seen fit in his sovereignty to include us in the work that he's done. We are the bearers of this ministry of reconciliation. Now, consider 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Everything is from God who has reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And he has committed the message of reconciliation to us. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we plead on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. We have the ministry of reconciliation. We have the message of reconciliation. We are the ambassadors of our king, pleading on his behalf to the broken and dying world, be reconciled to God. Are we doing this? Are we calling out for people to be reconciled to God, telling them about the love that he has for them, representing him as faithful ambassadors? Do we put as much energy and excitement into ex proclaiming the gospel as we do in proclaiming our support or disdain for this team or that team, for masks and vaccines, for this politician or that politician, this policy or that policy? Are we people who are pursuing the fulfillment of the role that God has given us as the church to be his representatives? Those other things, they might have some place in our discussions, but if we never proclaim the message of reconciliation, we have not done our job as ambassadors. I love God's people, the church, not just Eastern Hills, but, but I have to admit that this week I found myself frustrated by the church because it, it's almost as if we've decided that being ambassadors for Jesus means that we have to be jerks and do battle with every other person that we find any point of disagreement with, especially with each other. And I don't mean this body necessarily. Don't get me wrong. Sometimes we need to step up and we need to take a stand. We need to have a conversation. We need to be willing to risk disagreement with a brother or sister in Christ to bring necessary correction of sin or for the sake of the gospel. We, that needs to happen. But I can say that during this time of COVID, some of the best conversations that I've had with people were with those who disagreed with me. Because we, we approach the conversation from a position of love and respect for both Jesus and one another, wanting to hear one another and understand one another, even though we didn't see things eye to eye. And I think and I hope that those with whom I've had those conversations would agree with that assessment. I just looked at two of them. They both were like, yeah. It's vital for our ministry to one another and to a lost world that we would be willing to strive for peace, if possible, even if we disagree, and particularly with one another. Look at Romans 12. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Give careful thought to do what is honorable in everyone's eyes, if possible, as far as it depends on you. Live at peace with everyone. It's a critical part of this ministry that we've been given. If we can't maintain a state of reconciliation with one another in the face of disagreement over secondary or tertiary or quaternary issues, how will the world see the beauty of the bride of Christ, the change in life that believers claim to have, and want to hear about the one who came to bring reconciliation from us? We have enough enemies in this world without making more of them out of our brothers and sisters. If, if you're a believer who likes to attack or belittle or threaten other believers, either online or in person, please take a minute. 
Examine your actions and words in light of our calling as ministers of reconciliation. Do a heart check and stop it. Please. The world's watching. We don't need to fight each other. Think about it. Why would Satan want to mess with us if we're too busy messing with ourselves? He doesn't have to do anything. Just throw something controversial in our midst and we'll all jump on each other. It's a shame. We need to commit to telling people about our Prince of Peace, the one who died so that they could be reconciled to God. That's our role. That's our message. And that's the message that goes out to you this morning if you've never trusted in Christ, never surrendered in faith. You've heard what Jesus has done for you, how he died so that we could go from being God's enemies to being God's friend through trusting in what he has done to save us. Give up and trust in Jesus this morning. During our time of invitation, the band is going to come and play a song and Joe and Carrie and Trevor will be down uh, here at the front. We'll be here to receive you. Come and let us know that today you've surrendered your life to Christ so we can celebrate with you, help you as you start that journey. If you're online, send me an email to bill at ehbc.org so we can celebrate with you, get you some resources, maybe connect you with a church wherever you are, uh, if you're not in Albuquerque. If you have a work of reconciliation that you need to be a part of this morning, if there's someone in the church that you have wronged or that you need to make amends with, I mean, it's invitation, so we think that it all happens here, but there's nothing wrong with you going to one another and being reconciled right now. Nothing wrong with that. It's a great time for it. Just listen to the voice of the Spirit as He speaks. And if you want to take steps to join with this church family in formal membership this morning, believing that, that this is a church family where God can use you to serve and, and a church body that you can grow in and with, then let us know that as well. So we can take time to, to make, we can make an appointment to take time to sit down and answer any questions that you might have about the church, hear your story, share our story. If you're online, you can send me an email that as well. You can also give during this time online, or if you'd rather give in person, you can use the plates that are by the doors as you leave at the close of service. Thank God for our Prince of Peace and the reconciliation that only He can bring. Let's stand and pray together. God, you are so great. as the, the one who is most impacted by our sin, for you to decide that you're going to give your very best, your holy, righteous, perfect son to come and, and take on our flesh and live as one of us so that he could die for all of us so that we could have peace with you, it's incredible. It's incredible, God. And Lord, we confess that, Father, we don't always live out that peace that you've provided. But Lord, I pray that we would, that we would be active, effective ambassadors of your kingdom, ministers of reconciliation to one another and to the world around us. And God, I pray that that would start today. That you would be glorified by this body as we seek to proclaim the message of peace in Christ to a lost and dying world. And Father, for those who've heard that message of peace today and who've never surrendered, 
God, I pray that you would draw them by your spirit, that they would give up going their own way today, turn to you, and be saved. Lord, let your will be done in this place and in our lives, we pray. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Amen.